Hey church, welcome to the Midweek Bible Study. You know, we've been trying to do some things a little differently to keep everybody as connected as they can be, and you're going to notice today that we're going to be showing you part of a Zoom class that was held actually on Wednesday morning at, at 10 o'clock. Part of that recording worked well, and we had our technical problems, and part of it didn't. Uh, we're learning from those experiences, and just know that uh, we're going to smooth it out, but for those who are trying to get in, uh, just get with me before the class and we'll be able to get you logged in and make sure that everything is runs as smoothly as possible and we'll be changing how we do the recording next week so for this week what you'll notice is that we're going to start off with a recording from the zoom session itself which is going to show some of the people who are in attendance during the class kind of around the screen and then the audio is going to be kind of in and out because it's changing how how the recording is put together uh, then you'll see Jim kind of as the primary part of the rest of it. So we'll get these technical details straightened out, but just know that we love you and we want to be as in contact with you as we can. Uh, so let's try to be as, as tight a community as we can be as we struggle through the technology. But remember that the, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings is still on top and he's still on the throne. And uh, this is just about learning more about him. So uh, enjoy this class today and hopefully we'll have you a part of the class next week. God bless you. Bye bye. Well, I'm just delighted that we have so many people that are tuned in. Maybe next week when Floyd does this, we'll have a few more. You never know. But welcome to everybody. And uh, let me ask Marcia if she would start us with a prayer this morning. Marcia Taylor. Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we are blessed. We are healthy. We are fed, we are sheltered. Thank you. Thank you that we can come together and study your word. I pray that you would humble us, Lord, and help us to be your servants. And bless Jim and Adam, Lord, as we, we go through the challenges of today. And I pray your blessings on this nation and that you would eliminate this virus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, welcome again. Uh, I want to take just a couple of minutes to kind of review where we are for the people that may not have been with us either in, in the Zoom conference or on video. For the last uh, three or four weeks that I've been teaching or leading the class, We've been figuratively walking with Jesus and the 12 disciples as accounted by Matthew as they return from the transfiguration that Jesus experienced on Mount Hermon, which is up in the southwest corner of what's now the nation of Syria. And they're moving from there back down to Capernaum down on the southwest side of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus is, has been living off and on for the last three years or so. But they're really en route to Jerusalem for Jesus' last visit there where he will be tried and sentenced to death and then crucified. And on this walk, this journey, it's about 40, 50 miles. I've never really been able to figure out the exact amount. Jesus is instructing his disciples. And as we've learned in the previous lessons, the disciples have shown that they really don't understand the role that Jesus is fulfilling. They believe, as Peter confessed, that he is the Christ. They believe that he is the Son of God. They believe that he is the Messiah, but they don't understand the intent of God with respect to his role. They think he's going to be the king, that he's going to take control of everything and throw the, the Romans out of Israel. Did somebody ask a question? No. Uh, and this misunderstanding has been illuminated several times one of which we talked about last week when the disciples asked Jesus what their position in the kingdom was going to be. The kingdom, they're thinking now, the kingdom that Jesus is going to be running on earth. 
They want to know who's going to be daddy's favorite. And there is a rivalry among these 12 disciples that may have been enhanced by the perceived favoritism that Jesus gives to Peter and James and John. So they ask Jesus, who's going to be number one? And Jesus responded to them by telling them, you have to be childlike in order to be members of the kingdom. You have to be humble. And whoever approaches life in this fashion will be the greatest in the kingdom. And he's not talking about number one. He's just saying everyone who submits, everyone who is humble in their approach to life will be among the greatest. They cannot be concerned with their social status. And out of this beginning, in this journey, Jesus begins to instruct his disciples as to their role in his church. And as we talked about some time ago, this part of Matthew, this chapter 18, is often referred to by biblical scholars as the fourth discourse in Matthew. And they call it the discourse on the church, the conversation on the church. And he continued, as we talked about last week, to tell his disciples that as given their position in what will be his church as his apostles, as the leaders. They must make every effort not to lead other believers to sin. And one of the great conversations that deals with this guidance that Jesus gives his disciples occurred between Peter and Paul although Paul wasn't a disciple, where they were arguing over the question of circumcision. Must you be circumcised to be a member of Christ's church? One said yes, the other said no. And it was in this way that we could have led other believers to sin. So today, we're going to continue that discussion. We're going to continue that walk with Christ and the Twelve. Again, as he instructs them on things that they need to know in order to be apostles and members of his church. And with that, we're going to open our Bibles to Matthew 18. And Lil, would you read verses 10 through 14, please? Sheep, don't be cruel to any of these little ones. I promise you that their angels are always with my Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. What would you do if you had a hundred sheep and one of them wandered off? Wouldn't you leave the 99 on the hillside and go look for the one that had wandered away? Mm -hmm. I am sure that finding it would make you happier than having the 99 that never wandered off. That's how it is with our father, with your father in heaven. He doesn't want any of these little ones to be lost. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, I'm reading from the contemporary English version. It's the first Bible I picked up this morning, so I apologize. It's not the same. Okay. Uh, This is really a well known parable, but I want to give you another version of it. Marcia Taylor, would you read Luke chapter 15, verse 1 through 7? Luke. Sorry, Luke? Yes, I guess I do. Luke chapter 15. Okay, but now can they hear me? I can hear you, Gladys. Yes. Yeah. I can hear you, Gladys. Yes, I can. Okay. 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 Luke chapter 15. Verses 1 through 7. One through seven, yes. 
Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now the tax collector and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Mm -hmm. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 religious people who do not need to repent. Okay. Mm. Amen. Amen. I asked Marcia to read that passage in Luke for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I don't want you to confuse these two events and 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 believe that they are the same event. They are not. Oh. I can't definitely pin down the event that Luke is talking about, but I believe it was shortly after Jesus called Matthew to be his disciple and had dinner at Matthew's house mm -hmm. and was criticized by the Pharisees because other guests included tax collectors and he was eating with them. <clears throat> the point to remember is that the message of both of these parables is the same. And the reason that that's important is because it's yet again another clue for us or another sign for us that the scripture, the word of God, is consistent from beginning to end. <clears throat> and that we may or may not have every word that Jesus uttered when he was on earth but we have a body of, of work that gives us a very complete description of Jesus' ministry while he was here on earth in his role that was assigned to him by God. And I'm going to ask Jane this question. There is a, like many other passages of Scripture, there is a hymnal that was written about this particular passage. Jane, do you know what it is? Uh, well, when I think of it's not a poem, it's more a song, but when I walk, when I read a lot, and I I knew she would have an answer. No, 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 no. There's one that says 90, 99 and 1. That's it, Floyd. The 90 and 9. I'm going to read you because I can't sing it. The first stanza. There were 90 and 9 that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold. Away on the mountains wild and bare, away from the tender shepherd's care, away from the tender shepherd's care. When I looked it up on the internet, I found this recording of this old dude who was singing back in the early 19th century, accompanied by that I can't remember the name of the instrument, but it's kind of like a piano, but it has different kinds of tone. Yeah, that's it. So with that in your mind, let's start with the easy stuff. What does this, what does this par parable say to you? Anybody, whoever wants to. Thing and believers should 
understand that instead of saying, oh, well, you fell away, that's it, you're done, it's over, no hope for you. I think even before that, it says point blank, if you repent, then God will hear you home on Not just if you are a believer and you sin and repent, but if you just point blank repent and come to Jesus as Savior. Is there another parable that this reminds you of? Yes. Well, I think of John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6, and then um, 27 through 30, where it goes up here under the door of the sheep. And I don't have John up there yet, but I can go read it. My sheep hear my voice, and it's Pedro will not follow me. Um, fall in there. How about the prodigal son? Yeah, prodigal that's the one. Yeah, the prodigal son. Yes. The prodigal son is the one that I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. So, in this parable, the sheep are believers, uh, yeah. and of course, Jesus is the shepherd. And he has a hundred out there, and they come in, and he's missing one. And I immediately thought, well, why? how does he know that he's missing a sheep? I mean, they all look alike. They don't sound alike. They don't sound alike. I don't know about that, Jane. I don't know. He's man. Yeah. He knows them all by name. He knows them all by name. I'm reminded of the song, His Eyes on the Sparrow, you know. God knows every one of us individually. And when one of us is missing, he knows it. Nate and I used to live in Canada. And the house we lived in was right overlooking a reservoir. And at night, there would be different flocks of geese that came in and would land on the lake. And one night, I'm watching them come in. They're all settled in, and here comes one. And he hears the voices of his, of his flock and he lands right in the middle of that block. Yeah. And it's, I stood there and I just thought, isn't that amazing? That that goose knew the sound of this flock and landed right by me. It is amazing. Why do you think Jesus uses sheep in this parable and, uh, and in others? You know, in John, John tells us that Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Why does he use sheep? They're weak. They're weak-minded. They, they just they don't follow anything. I think it's because there were a lot of sheep there in that time, and there were a lot of shepherds, so they could relate well. Yeah. I think you're both right. You know, Jesus uses parables throughout his ministry. <coughs> And he uses them as allegories so that people can understand what he is, what he's talking about. Uh, because he wanted his audience to connect with these stories so that they would listen to them and maybe come to understand them. And he uses them in the latter part of his ministry as vehicles to help his audience understand that the accusations and the charges levied against him by the religious leaders were false. He was trying to bring them around to his ministry and away from the leadership that then existed. So, as Lil said, sheep are familiar animals. They're they're common. They're recognizable. And as Tom says, they're weak-minded. They're herd animals. They travel in packs. And if one of them gets lost, or uh, separated from the pack, they don't know what to do, and they're liable to just stand there and let some predator kill them. They have a difficult time, evidently, making decisions. So when we think about this parable approach to teaching, what can we take away from this particular parable? 
What are the lessons learned, so to speak, that we can take away from this parable? Floyd, what do you, what do you think? That, that uh, Luke 15, uh, I like that. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus receives Christians for us. As sorry as old Floyd is, he, he accepted me and loves me. And sometimes we can look down at our neighbor, and sometimes we can look at the fellow down the street and not really care about his life. But you, Jesus does and did uh, care for his life. I think you're right. I would say that if we boil what Floyd said down to kind of a lesson learned, the lesson that I get from that is that God loves each and every one of us and he loves us so much that when we stray, when we sin, he misses us. Even though we're indistinguishable from all of the other people out there in his flock. And when he misses us, he comes to get us. And he does that through Jesus, his only son. Because Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood for us, so that we would not have to die. And that's, to me, the central theme of this particular parable. And so when we're missing, he comes looking for us. And when he finds us, he picks us up, allows us to repent, forgives us, and brings us back to the flock. And when we think of it this way, that then takes us to those last two verses in this parable. And let me read it to you right quick so we remember it. And if he finds it, the lost sheep, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And here I'd like you to think about the parable of the prodigal son. And you'll recall when you think about it that the father of the prodigal son rejoiced when he returned, but his brother was jealous. His brother was jealous of the fuss, the party that the father threw upon the return. return. So when you look at that last verse, verse 14, what does that mean to you? Anybody? Makes the call of God is for anyone and everyone, Jim. The least and the biggest. You're exactly right, Floyd. God's love, His grace, encompasses everyone, even those who sin, and there is a way back through Jesus Christ. God wants no one to perish. He wants to cast no one into that lake of fire that Revelation tells us about. And if we look at Revelation where it says the sheep to the right and the goats to the left, God doesn't want any goats. He wants everyone to be saved. Sinners and believers alike. Any comments on this parable? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, Jesus went out to get the uh, lost, lost sheep. What about the 99? Was he afraid that maybe a wolf would come in and, and destroy the flock? Do you think that he values the one more than the 99? No, I think he values them all equally. I think he does also. And I don't have my Bible here in front of me. I should, but I don't. But in the book of John, Jesus... He's not talking about this particular parable, but 
he is in fact when he says I am the good shepherd what he says is that I am the gate through which the sheep pass and once they have passed through the gate they are safe and so in that context I think what Jesus is doing is he has delivered that 99 to a safe place and he is out and about looking for the one that is missing anybody got any thoughts on that Yes. Matthew 18? Yes. I, I say to you, he rejoices it over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Right. That's kind of the older brother. He never went astray. Right. So I just, Tom, I wonder if the 99 were mad because you left them to go find that one. <laughs> we're mad? Yeah, we're mad like the older brother. Oh, how, yeah. How come he left us to go find that one? But he left them in a safe place. As Floyd said, they are weak minded. They probably wouldn't go that far. What do you think about it? Right. Yeah. Right. And after all, I think it is a problem. Maybe after she goes. Who knows? This she because he didn't want people to worry about them. Well, no, she probably don't get that. Well, but if you go back and read verse 13 where it says he rejoices over it, he's rejoicing over the recovery, not so much the individual sheep. He's rejoicing that the sheep has been recovered, and that does not mean that he loves that sheep more than any of the 99. He's just glad that it's returned to the fold, as was the father of the prodigal son. Yes. Anything else? Station on Sunday, a little Pentecostal church. There was about ten people there, half half black and half white. That's encouraging. Baptisms there that morning. And we rejoiced over that. Okay. There was a lot of people there, two baptisms. I think I think you can you can rejoice when someone comes to faith in Christ Jesus. And that's what this story is telling us right here. If I lose my phone, I go chaotic till I find that phone. I march up, call that phone, call that phone. I don't even know where to bring it. And when you find that phone, you rejoice that you found it. <laughs> guess what? When a person comes to Christ, it's that same rejoicement. He has found his way home. The master is calling that he's found his way home. There's a great rejoicing when one person comes to Christ. Well, let me ask you a final question on this parable. What does parable mean for the church today? That we need to be evangelistic and bring in people from the fold. That we need to be inclusive. Yes. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Us, we need to make sure that we don't lose. Well, we call them leaders, but fellow believers. It's important that we make sure we keep everybody. Make everybody feel included? Right. Make everybody, because it's important that we don't leave anybody behind. I think it's important to remember that Jesus is looking for that missing one. So we should be too. How do we how do we do that? I remember when I was growing up in East Texas, which was segregated, <clears throat> in our church there was no black people. They would not have been allowed had they showed up. And that just happens to be the color that was the color line that was there in, in East Texas. It could very well have applied to yellow or red or whatever. Yeah. Do we still practice or preach or look for things that separate us in our church? Did you say do we look or did you say can we? That's it. Is, is there, are there still those barriers in the church, our church, 
any church today? Yes, I think so. The church or our church? Great. You're talking about the Christian church? I'm talking about the Christian church. This is the... Um, you can you can use our church as an example, but mm -hmm. I'm really talking about the entire Christian church, whether it be Catholic or Protestant or Presbyterian or whatever it might be. Jim, my mother, my mother on Easter, she would she would look at all the women and how they dressed and came in, and if they didn't have their hat on on Easter, you said, "What was wrong with that woman?" <laughs> you, know, you know, a lot of, a lot of the church. Uh, has looked at someone else who doesn't dress quite right, who doesn't look quite right, who doesn't talk quite right, point our fingers that they're not a part of us. Thank God. Thank God. I sound like a thing. I thank God I still listen to me sometimes. <laughs> well, I want to... Church where the women were... had to wear hats. <laughs> you had to have a hat on. Oh my God, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're beyond that, you know. Exactly. There was a time when people wore gloves and hats and ties and all of that stuff. I think we're beyond that. Yeah. But I'm not sure that we solved the overarching problem. I, I didn't hear that. I said, I think satin gloves should be brought back. They're pretty. Oh. Well. Hopefully you can you can do that whether you require other people to or not. Right. <laughs> I, I do believe that our church has issues. Um, part of them are contributed to by our culture, which is so oriented to top down or either or or this way that way. We are a, a society who looks at details and. Generally, we make judgments based on those details. I remember when our kiddos were little, and I took Joanna and Dan with me to a favorite donut shop after we were at the library. And Danny, sitting beside me, picked up my hand, held up three fingers, and whispered, There is a very fat lady over there with three donuts. <laughs> I had to decide what to say. I said, well, I'd like you and Joanna can share the one you're having. But we tell each other not to notice differences, and we teach each other to notice them and not to know what to do with them except push them away. And I see that in church when we don't know how to welcome someone who is different for whatever reason. So, I, yes, I see that. So, I, and that's, I, a, <clears throat> that's a perfect seg segue into the next topic. If we could um, move on here, we've got to, we're getting toward the end of our time. Marsha, would you read uh, Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20? And that's Marsha Brooks, please. Oh, which? 15 through 20. What, what did you say? Matthew. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. Treat 
them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So that goes back to what Pastor Just Adam a second, says. we need to finish it up. Uh, Marcia, continue 18 through 20. I'm sorry. What? Again, a very familiar passage of scripture for all of us, I suspect. And I would ask you to remember that when we were looking at Matthew 16, when Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, Jesus proclaimed at that time that he will build his church on this rock. Now he's changing the direction of this conversation with his disciples from what is required to be a member of the church to the kingdom to how we're going to treat those members who commit offenses let's start with verse 15 what does it mean to you when Jesus tells us tell him his fault and do it privately anybody if you, don't, if you do it publicly it's humiliating and um, it could be uh, considered, what's the word I'm looking for? Condem untrue. Condemnatory. It could be untrue. Yes. Or it could be considered gossip. We haven't given him a chance to explain. Right. So the bottom line is, and when we do this, we're not trying to score points against this person but we're trying to win him over to bring him back into the fold you know uh, it's it's a a peaceful approach I guess is the way that I would characterize it Jesus also tells us that when we do this we need to do it with humility because uh, if we go to someone and tell him, well, you know, you really screwed this up here the other day and you need to change your way, what we're saying is we are better than you. We know better than you. We are in a position that you're not and you need to change your way so you can join the crowd. Uh, when I thought about that, I thought, well, you know, my in our family, we say you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. And I think that's that's appropriate here. But there's a there's an Old Testament basis for this particular approach, and we find it in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, where it says, "You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him." So Jesus then goes on, he says, if this private approach doesn't work, it's time to elevate it. So I would ask you, what do verses 16 and 17 require of us here in the church? Anybody? That, that we go to them first, quietly and humbly, and if the person can't hear and receive it, and we can't bring them back, then we bring another one or two and see if that way there can be a, a healing process. And if that doesn't work, then we have to bring it to the church. And if that still does not bring resolution, that parable declares we have to treat them like we would a tax collector and anathema. Yeah. Um, there's also an Old Testament uh, basis for this particular 
rule, and we find it in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. I couldn't find any link to that in our jury system, but it seems to me that the concept of a trial by jury is based on this uh, Old Testament law and Jesus' interpretation of it. And so when we expel this guy as a pagan, how do we do that? Anybody? So we expel them from the church. Are they are they never coming back? Can they change? Can we take them back? Yes, like the sheep. Yes. Like the hundred sheep. And that's a connection with that first parable, isn't it not? Well, it also goes back to something that we talked about last week where Jesus told his disciples the person who leads a believer to sin should be drowned in the ocean. He wasn't speaking literally, but what he was saying is we expel them from the church until they change and we bring them back. He went on to say, if your eye offends you, pluck it out because it's better to be with one without an eye than it is to be cast into the lake of fire as a sinner. Uh, th this is just a logical continuation of that guidance that he gave to his disciples as he is about to dispatch them to spread the word throughout the world to create his church. This is what we're going to do. These are the rules of the road. Paul tells us in Romans 16 verse 17, I appeal to you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. Now let me ask you a question, those of you who were paying attention Sunday, where did that come from? That was the last verse. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> when Pastor Ann was talking about 3C living, his last point was to really be, to be cautious. Cautionary. Cautionary, thank you. About people. Um, and, and I don't remember all of the details of that part of the discussion. Yeah, well, you know, he said communicate, commend, and caution yeah. the three C's of friendship and that was the last verse of the scripture reading Sunday and it is to me pretty plain we don't associate with people who sin but we do try to cause them to change their ways we give them a venue into the church to come as believers so let me close this out a little bit by talking about binding and loosing. I really had trouble with that. I couldn't figure it out when I read it. And come to find out, this is a Jewish legal phrase. And its meaning is to give authority to someone to determine whether something is allowed or forbidden. It's the basis for the Jewish judge, as best I could determine. And Jesus first used it in Matthew 16 when he talks about building his church and he says I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven 
And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And here in this scripture, he's telling Peter that he has the right. Peter has the right to enter the kingdom of heaven himself. He has the keys that confer that authority upon him. And he's telling him that to do that, we preach the gospel to open the kingdom of heaven to all believers and to shut it to unbelievers. And every Christian has a role to play in this effort. You remember that in Matthew 6, when Jesus told us how to pray, he starts his prayer, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the authority to admit or to expel from the kingdom or from the church comes from God. And Jesus gives his disciples, us, the authority to correctly interpret that message and share it with other believers and non-believers. And so the last question of the day. Do verses 19 and 20 promise us that if two or more people pray for something that God has to answer that prayer? Anybody? Yes. God doesn't have to do anything, but it says that he will. No, that doesn't. No. Huh? Yeah, by my Father in heaven. Yeah. This, for where two or three are gathered in my name, if we're gathered together, but we're not in the name of Christ Jesus, no, we're not going to get resolved in that, his favor. No, I... I think the short answer to my question is no. Two or three people can't get together and pray and, and, and write a, a promissory note that God's got to pay off. I mean, that's exactly the, the way that some people interpret it. If two or three people pray, then God's got to answer that prayer. Wow. No, he may answer the prayer, but not the way that you're asking for it. I know. Thank you, Adam. They, let, let me give you a, a, a different way of, of looking at that particular scripture because Adam is exactly on point. I think what it means is that what Jesus is saying here is if the two or more individuals in the church come to agreement concerning a matter, whether it be expelling a person from the church or allowing someone back into the church, if they pray and come to agreement in a godly way, then that is acceptable to God. It's acceptable in heaven. And that's because we see God's will and purpose standing behind this binding and loosing uh, authority that Jesus is describing. And Jesus' presence is assured whenever two or three people gather in his name, just as Floyd said a minute ago. And when they render a decision on behalf of his church, Jesus will approve that decision if it's done so in a godly fashion. 
And the thing to remember also is that in these instances where the church comes together and makes a decision, Jesus takes God's place because he is God. He will be with the judges. Questions or comments? I really appreciate all of you joining us this morning. We had a couple of technical problems, but I, I believe truly in my heart that those will be worked out over time as we get more familiar with what it is that we're doing here. And I hope that our audience will grow as opposed to people not coming back. And I look forward to more and more of these with you as we work our way through this coronavirus restriction phase in our lives right now. Would you join me in prayer for just a minute? Father, we thank you so much for this day and for these believers who are with us here today to study your word. And we thank you for your word because we know that it gives us the truth and the way that we should live our lives and we should reach out to others. We are enveloped by your grace every time we gather together, whether we are here in the church or in our homes via this Zoom conference. And we appreciate all of the blessings that comes to us through that grace. We ask for your wisdom to help us to understand the things that we find in your word, the guidance that we find, the instructions that come to us in terms of living a righteous life. We need your help. We understand that and we seek it and we do so actively as we come together to study it and we ask for your blessings upon our effort. We ask that you be with those who are ill and afflicted in our church family and in our families and that you would be with the father of, with the family of our brother Nolan Bating who is with you today. We know that they are in grief. We know that you are with them, and we know that no one is with you. And we ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.